Members, can I remind you <coughs> that this meeting will be recorded and ask you to take note that mobile phones should be switched off as they interfere with recording. Tablet devices should be switched to mute. Can I remind, remind members to declare their interests as appropriate throughout the meeting? Can I advise members that the meeting will move into closed session at the end of the meeting for members to consider his response to the budget and the legal advice on the proposal of Farmers for Action? And I declare the meeting open to the public. And item one, apologies. Are there any apologies? Uh, I have one from Sydney Anderson. Yes. Okay. Come on to our funeral. Yeah. Any others? Then item two, chairperson business. Can I advise members that I and the deputy chairperson met informally with Rivers Agency officials this morning. We heard about Camlock Reservoir and how it nearly breached during heavy rain uh, this week. The committee will receive a written brief soon. We will also, also, we also ask for a more detail, detailed breakdown of the characteristic, characteristics of the private owners of reservoirs. Please advise the committee. No, that's okay. Uh, agenda item three, minutes of the meeting, 18th of November 2014. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting on the 18th of November 2014 at pages 6 to 11? Are members content that the, the draft minutes are accurate? Okay. Okay. So I will sign. Then item four, matters arising. Can I refer members to matters arising at pages 12 to 19? Are members content to action matters arising as suggested on the index sheet at page 13? Okay. Then okay. item five. <coughs> We have an oral briefing from our, from our project, Anti-Poverty and Social Inclusion. Can I refer members to the briefing, briefing paper from the Public Health Agency, which has been tabled at page 3 to 22. Can I welcome uh, Gary Black, uh, Assistant Director of PHA, and Colette Brawley, Health and Social Wellbeing and Improvement Monitor, PHA. You're very welcome. You. We'll ask you to give us... Uh, up to 10 minutes of the briefing. Yes. And then we'll ask questions. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Chairman, members of the committee. Um, Public Health Agency is delighted to be here this afternoon to give you <coughs> evidence about the MARA programme, which many people will have heard about, but we hope we'll give you a better sense and flavour of um, the detail of that. Um, my name is Mary Black, Assistant Director of Health and Social Wellbeing with the Public Health Agency. And I also chair the Interdepartmental Regional Project Management Forum for MARA. And I'm joined by Colette Brawley, who is one of the Health and Social Wellbeing Improvement Managers with Public Health Agency, but she's also led on the development of MARA now for a number of years. So the MARA project was funded through DARD's Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Funding. And in the main, with additional funding uh, provided by the Public Health Agency over a three-year period when we come to the conclusion of this funding period. Uh, of almost 2.9 million over that three-year period. MARA, in our view, is an exceptional project that tackles many of the issues which impact on health and well-being of the rural population, including poverty, isolation, safety and, of course, health and well-being, which is where we have entered into it. So the aim of MARA has been to improve the health and well-being of rural dwellers in Northern Ireland by increasing access to services, grants and benefits by facilitating a coordinated service to support rural dwellers living in or at risk of poverty and social exclusion. The MARA project has proactively targeted the most vulnerable households and identified rural communities using a community development approach. Over that three-year period, we have um, helped many <coughs> thousands of households. We regularly receive feedback and case studies of people who've benefited from the project, and most notably, where MARA intervention has had a huge impact on their lives. This may be simple things like access to a smart pass to enable people to use community and, and uh, uh, public transport. Um, additional benefits uh, amounting to hundreds of thousands of pounds. Installation of heating or insulation, which will tackle fuel poverty, and the installation of practical measures to help facilities for disabled or elderly residents, such as home safety equipment. Um, I'm now going to pass to Colette Brawley, who will give you a, a 
closer understanding of some of the outcomes of that work over the past three years. And then, members, I'd like to conclude with some of what we perceive to be the benefits of this programme. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman, members of the committee. Um, at the end of October, um, all the lead delivery organisations which we had procured to deliver this project on the ground had successfully achieved and indeed exceeded the targets set out in their contracts. This achievement has resulted over the last three years in the completion of 12,270 first visits. Um, and in addition to that, we have undertaken over 10,000 second visits. The second visit uh, allows the householder to have another opportunity to uh, ensure that any grant services and benefits that have been identified on the original um, application is followed through on. So the, the 80 per cent or thereabout was our target for a second visit in households. Um, as a result of these visits, almost 32,700 referrals have been made to a range of organisations. So that's an average of one in three referrals um, from the visits made. Referrals have been made for um, benefit entitlement checks to Social Security Agency, um, to energy efficiency schemes such as warm homes or the replacement schemes. Uh, through rural transport to rural transport for services such as the Smart Pass um, and membership of the local rural transport partnerships, um, to the local councils for home safety checks, and then through the health care <coughs> for occupational therapy and social services. And then, importantly as well, to a wide range of local services that will enable um, Householders to feel more included within their local community. So that could be as simple as um, an older people's group, um, an art group, uh, a dance group, a computer class, so a whole range of, of different services there. Um, our aim now is to bring every one of these 32,700 referrals to an outcome. So it's important for us in the project that we understand what has happened to every referral that has been made. And we've uh, achieved that so far, and we only have about 5,000 more outcomes to determine from the project. So of the project to date, um, 1,509 households have benefited from advice and installation of energy efficiency measures, uh, equivalent to £1.9 million. 5,377 5, households have been issued with advice and equipment following a home safety check, and the cost of that is to be determined. 388 people have received additional welfare benefits from 436 successful claims. This has amounted to over 1 million in additional benefits, and that's an ongoing piece of work that we're um, doing with Social Security Agency to bring these to a conclusion. 831 households have been now registered with the Rural Transport Partnership. Uh, 293 households have received a smart pass, and a total of 418 boiler replacement applications have been approved, totaling 284,000. And to date, 298 of these have been successful and have been claimed, totaling 205,000. Uh, and the, the detail of this will become um, more obvious as the evaluation of the project is undertaken in the new year. Um, we have a six month window now from January to June to do a detailed evaluation on the project. Therefore, of the outcomes we know to date, the project has secured over £3.2 million in additional grants and benefits for householders, with, um, I would say, a lot more to come in terms of the further outcomes in this. We will also do a social return on investment and measure those things that are very difficult to get a value for in terms of actual hard, hard sums and hard cash, um, and we will take this as part of a social return on investment, and this will be done as an external evaluation to the project. Um, we have been able to collect detailed information on our outcomes because of the robust IT system that we have put in place um, and has been developed for the MARA project. And this database has proved to be an integral part of the overall management and reporting of the MARA project, <coughs> capturing up-to-date reports on visits and progress with referrals by each individual zone. The system also continues to provide automated referrals, so on a weekly basis we automate referrals to a range of our partners. The clients are not sitting waiting for those referrals to be made, so it's done on an automated uh, process, particularly for those other statutory partners that we have um, and have been able to do that for. Um, members will have, as part of their briefing paper, details of the information contained within the MARA system um, and consent of use of this for monitoring and evaluation purposes, as well as for referral to a range of agencies, um, which we ask the, the householder to approve before we make referrals. 
This system includes information on demographics of the household. Um, if the householder has access to broadband, is something else we're measuring. It also um, includes all the information, and it's an intelligent <coughs> system to enable us to make onward referrals to a range of services, grants, and benefits. And uh, uh, to conclude, in terms of the, the information on the system, I think it's really important that this time around, which we didn't do in the first phase of the project, as we have asked the households the reason why they have not applied for these benefits, grants, and services in the past. And I think this will be um, really important learning for uh, a range of organisations in terms of why people are not obtaining benefits that they're entitled to. So I'll now pass you back to Mary, and Mary will outline why the Mara project has been successful and how we think the project will work uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay, um, Chairman, members. Um, I would like to stress that it's not just the financial benefit. We've given you an outline there of the financial return against the investment, but of course the benefits are much broader than that in terms of quality of life sense of engagement and reducing social isolation of many impoverished and isolated households in rural communities. The breadth of services offered um, <coughs> and the number of key partners from the statutory and voluntary um, uh, sector organisation have been very significant in bringing about this success. And we do believe that it has addressed the key aims of the um, uh, rural poverty isolation measure. It's an example of real partnership. Um, partnership amongst departments, that is the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, and Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, many delivery organisations, um, as well as working in the interdepartmental um, forum with uh, colleagues in DRD and DSD, as well as the Housing Executive. So there's been a great deal of effort in terms of developing the partnership. At a local delivery level, there's been a great deal of work to work with all of the organisa organisations involved in the delivery. And key amongst that has been the 13 delivery organisations from community and voluntary sector organisations who have led on the delivery of this um, programme. MARA offers a holistic assessment and signposting service, avoiding the risk of a silo approach. One organisation going into a household and dealing with their issue of concern. Instead, it attempts to go in and assess holistically and actually bring together the various components that will improve the life and health and wellbeing of that household. And in turn, offers practical support by referring to grants, services and benefits. So that close working relationship, <coughs> excuse me, in particular between DARD and PHA has been at the heart of this. And the communication has improved understanding to enable regular advice and support to be provided to the lead organisations and the enablers, which are local people that have been trained throughout the 13 different um, uh, areas that, that we are working in uh, to deliver the programme. The project has allowed the identification and engagement of those most isolated and rural households and in a way that current measures that many mainstream services are not able to reach. And I think our learning from that has been very powerful. It has also enabled those people who are not availing of their entitlements to avail of them and of course to access grants and other support mechanisms. It has been, in some senses, more intense in that it is focused on households, but it is the most vulnerable in society that we're reaching, and the return is showing significant economic benefits in relation to the amount invested. So the project has supported the households, as Colette has outlined. Uh, the use of the IT and portable computer systems is in itself another area of learning that we hope to use and transfer some of that learning to other systems. And the cross-sectoral work afforded by the programme in terms of access, cooperation and expertise uh, that has been evident at departmental, at the grassroots level with the 13 delivery organisations and indeed uh, ministerial cooperation has really led to a very unique partnership delivery um, uh, for some of those most isolated communities. And I would like to say that when the severe weather came in 2012, no, 11, 12, it was because of the work we'd done with those local community partnerships that we were actually able to get 
information, advice and practical support to some of those very isolated households. And um, that effective partnership, I think, has been evident um, throughout the programme. And of course, it's been supported by a dedicated um, staff team that works uh, with all of those partners. So, in terms of the future, there is a need for a project which proactively targets households uh, in order to enable the uptake of this benefits. We believe it will be of a much smaller scale going forward into the future. But we also think that the learning in terms of influencing mainstream services uh, from this programme is very important and we've been using the interdepartmental forum as a means to share that learning and some of the evidence which may be relevant for primary health care, social security in, in urban and uh, er, in urban areas as well as uh, rural areas. The affordable warmth programme at the minute being led by DSD and the housing executive has indeed adopted a similar household approach. So we're working very closely with them again to shortcut some of the lessons that we've learned through MARA and indeed they are part of that interdepartmental advisory forum. We are also mindful with DARD of the need to avoid duplication of effort and potential confusion for households. So again, we're working very hard to scope that within those rural areas uh, to make sure that that is um, not um, the case uh, going forward into the future. So in closing, Chairman and um, members, I think it is and has been a very important part of our learning to develop and deliver through true partnership working at all levels, as I've mentioned. But the case studies are the ones that really stay with me and make greatest impact in terms of what it has meant to individuals as a result of this programme. So I can think of an adult woman who was looking after a brother with mental health issues and she had and found benefit from both energy efficiency, increased benefits and referral to support both for herself and her elderly brother. I can think of an older man uh, who hadn't been to Inniskillen for many years because he had simply lost the confidence and through access to community transport and the smart pass has been able to re-engage socially. Or an older woman who had practically been given one very small tool which was to help put her socks on and it made a massive difference to her sense of independence and control over features in her life. So that's Myra. Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Certainly, um, most of us that have any feelings and knew about Mara has certainly done a very good job. In paragraph 7 of your paper, you mentioned Mara Extended. And again, yes. in paragraph 10, you talk about the successor programme. Yes. Given that we all know there's going to be budget constraints uh, into the future, in your opinion, where should the priorities be for the future in regard to... Well, I, I, I would point to two priorities. First is extended MARA is at a much smaller scale uh, than the full programme because it's doing the pickup of those that have not yet been included and we think that lower scale of investment will be appropriate going forward in terms of an ongoing programme. The other benefit that I didn't talk about at all is the skills and development within the 13 delivery organisations. That's a permanent resource for the future. So a lower level of investment coupled with that um, skilled development now that we've got in those 13 delivery organisations offers a partnership for the future. Um, and I guess the other thing then is in terms of the future is the mainstreaming where those lessons can influence other systems. So I do think it's important to maintain a level of investment, but I do not believe that it's required at the same level that it has been in the past. Okay. You did in, in your presentation mention the, the, the difficulties in ensuring that there was no duplication. How do you manage it to, to avoid duplication? Because okay, well, and maybe let collect to that very specific issue of affordable homes, because that's a very yeah. real example. I mean, the Affordable Warm project is just about to commence, so, you know, as we've been doing, Mara, all along, I think we have been conscious of other programmes that are out there that offer, for example, um, benefit uptake would be one of the key ones there. Um, what we try and do is um, ensure that um, the project, when we, we established it, we did a very detailed scoping of what services were available there and there were none at that stage that offered the same approach where there might be other schemes available out there um, in terms of that personal approach 
it was very unique to Mara. So I think the fact that we were getting into the households to people who would not normally come in a veil of both other schemes because you had to bring yourself forward for them. Because afford affordable warmth will work um, in a similar way in that it's targeting households and being very proactive, um, we have to work very closely now with that scheme as we move forward and we have um, had initial discussions on how we could do that. One way in the future, for example, might be that the affordable warmth programme is extended to take on some of the services that Mara currently do because at the minute affordable warmth, as far as I'm aware, only would consider energy efficiency and benefit uptake would be the two key elements of that programme. But what we could do is look at could we um, add those other elements onto that assessment so that at least that's a three year funded programme and it would reduce duplication as we go forward. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Can I thank you for your presentation? Although I would like to have seen the briefing paper head off today. It's on right. the table, so yeah. it's quite a lot to, to read through and to give at the last minute. Um, on your website, you, you talk um, about the high nature of poverty and isolation, making it difficult to connect with the most vulnerable rural people. And I know, Mary, um, you referred to this as an exceptional project. Yeah. Um, what percentage of those who have benefited from the project were farmers? And also, how do you get the message out to people in really isolated areas? And I'm thinking uh, mainly of pensioners who would not have access to the internet. And I know you spoke about internet use. How do you connect to those type of people and the farmers? You hit that up. Um, well, I suppose in terms of the percentage of farmers, I can certainly get that data. I don't have it to hand you on at the minute, but I can certainly get that okay. for you in terms of the percentage of farmers that would have availed to the project. Um, in terms of the, the second part of your question, um, I think because we have um, a, an approach in Mara that we use local knowledge to identify households, we're not relying on indicators or stats to, to do that. Um, and, and often in areas, it's a matter of the, the lead organisation sitting down with the community groups in their areas and basically, if not walking, their area, but certainly mapping their area in terms of who lives where and what kind of support would they need. So, is, that an, is there an elderly person there who would have limited family support, for example, who may have a health condition? So, it's about using that local knowledge of those areas, and local that's why I think it's on the ground, on the ground the and it's linking into key people on the ground. It could be the postman, it could be the clergy, it could be somebody else. Now, there's people who will self refer in Demara as well because they've heard. You know, through word of mouth from another another person that have, has availed to the project, but certainly in ter terms of it's that very local grassroots knowledge mm -hmm. that's made this project work. And you know, we've heard of the lead organisation saying they have gone really and, and walked their streets to find out who lives where and how they can support them. Okay. Well, if you can back to me with the garden farmers, farmers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can <coughs> did you consider linking up with other government agencies? I know you spoke about health yeah. and your links that uh, you feel were, are very successful. Working with rural people, I'm thinking of. FE colleges because Clet, you spoke of the computer classes, the dance classes, um, and we know, and this is sort of something that I have alluded to before, the FE colleges, the work they do with the community courses as well um, to help. So, do you help promote or advertise um, your project with them? Mm -hmm. The scheme would be advertised widely in a whole range of, of different um, outlets as well as trying to use that grassroots approach. So we're using all levels really of, of kind of um, advertising to try and get that um, message through about Mara and make the referrals. Yeah, and the other thing is that all this information, for example, will have gone out to the chief executives of the six health and social care trusts and in turn to all of their staff. It's gone out to all GPs. It's So we've widely, uh, pharmacy, you know, that information has been um, shared very widely. So the referrals and the understanding of the scheme have come widely. The other thing is when you get down to the 13 different local area uh, in terms of the organisations, they in turn then make connections with what's happening in the local college, where there's a class, where there are other supports. So it's they, localised, that's exactly, actually, exactly. Colleges. Yeah. As well as the strategic kind of stuff, there's okay. a much more local approach when it goes into those areas. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> in terms of it, there seems to be a lot of concentration on the fact that people um, are financially in difficulties. Yeah. And I assume that would be across the rural community, so it would be people who are both from a farming background and non farming background? Yes. And we'll, and we'll pick up that point about the farming families per se. Yeah. And are you finding a correlation between 
um, people who are having financial difficulties and mental health issues in the rural community? Well, yes, but also within the context of within Northern Ireland in different mm -hmm. disadvantaged communities, we see that pattern. So that it's not only in rural communities. Um, but it is a particular issue in rural communities because the sense of isolation can be stronger and felt more keenly by people. Um, it is also true to say that the Public Health Agency, along with DARD, also run another programme called the Farm Families Check Scheme, which is specifically aimed at farmers and their families precisely because of that sense of isolation. It's not only looking at mental health and wellbeing, it's looking at many other factors. But um, it is specifically within the rural community highlighting farmers and their families. But it is true, and evidence would support this, that rural isolated communities in one sense have stronger bonds, stronger protective factors in terms of mental health and well-being, but on the other hand may lead to people feeling more isolated and therefore those feelings in terms of mental health and well-being can be um, increased. Can identify an association between um, mental health and, and financial hardship? Yes, you can, most definitely. There will be as well, in terms of the evaluation, um, more detail provided on the health and wellbeing status of those households. We've done that, um, a questionnaire with them as well when we go in around uh, a range of, of mental health and wellbeing issues and you know, how they, they actually feel at the time and how they feel after the project has been <coughs> done. We've um, further evaluation on that, so that will come up through the evaluation work as well. Yeah. But the link with poverty and deprivation, whether it be rural or urban, and yeah. mental health is a very strong relationship, you're quite right. Okay. okay. Joe Byrne. The Chairman, <coughs> I welcome the presentation and admire the work that Mara has done so far. In <coughs> relation to the partnerships, does the partnership have to be in existence before they can work through Mara? And secondly, in relation to going forward, how do you see this Mara project growing in the future? Naturally? Okay, but well, if you want to take the first bit. So, could you repeat the first bit of it again? Sorry, I wasn't. Yeah. Could you? I, I'm comprehending here that Mara is a coordinating yeah. yes. organisation. Yeah. Uh, does a, an existing voluntary community partnership have to be in existence yeah. in order to access and facilitate okay. and deal with you? Okay, sorry. So, there's, there's actually there's a, a range of, of levels with, of partnership working within the Mara project um, and certainly in terms of the, the organisations who are leading the project on the ground, they had a, um, applied through a formal tender process. So what we had asked of them at the time is that um, they wouldn't just come as their own organisation but they had to show in terms of their application how they would link with a range of other community and voluntary organisations on the ground to um, take that project forward in the local area. So there certainly are mainly the, the bids for the project in terms of delivery were from well organised constituted organisations and most of those are actually rural community networks. Um, but they also work with then a range of local um, community and voluntary groups on the ground to roll out the project. They work with those groups to help identify the households, for example, and to make referrals to those community services that, the, that those groups operate. Um, and we, we established then a partnership to take forward the work of Mara. We had a, an original project where we'd done over 4,000 households from 2008 to 2009, and we built on that. So we built on our interdepartmental um, project and partners then for the Mara project. So there are different layers, but if you're talking mainly about um, the, the, the community level, it's about strong organisations being able to deliver that on the ground, and the rural networks are the main delivery organisations for us. And is there a service level agreement with Mara? Yeah. Or, okay. The service level agreement. The PHA holds a service level agreement with each of the um, local community networks um, or, or, or community organisations. There's one or two or not networks. Um, but in their main community networks, and we would hold um, a service level agreement for delivery of the targets um, and the bu original business case with those organisations. And my second question do you yeah. see Mara expanding or extending its remit and range of activities? Um, I don't see Mara as it is currently constituted expanding because I think um, we will um, feel that we have accessed a lot of those rural isolated communities. So I think the future for Mara looks slightly different in that it would be a more scaled down approach 
using the lead organisations, those 13 different partnerships uh, or their equivalents, uh, to maintain <coughs> a level of service within those communities um, that as and when required. But perhaps a more <coughs> important aspect of the future is at that level that's supporting those local communities, but the programme as a whole influencing and informing other programmes that are seeking to reduce poverty, social isolation and all of these factors which influence health and wellbeing and inequalities in health. And that's a very big prize, you know, in terms of how we take some of those lessons forward. Okay, and lastly, Chairman, you're saying here that the IT system has worked very well. It's good to hear about an organisation. I know. The top of the IT system working. Why is that so? Well, a huge amount of effort went into developing it. Is one a huge amount? How much money? Oh, well, on that we did rather well, because they were developing and testing a new system. So, in fact, we know we've got far more for our money's worth out of it than we actually paid for, because it was in their interest to develop this new technology. So we've actually been, we've benefited from that, but the actual amount of money is what? It's about 100,000 in total that we've paid, and that includes um, the maintenance, or a small amount for maintenance, but 100,000 with about 6,000 maintenance um, per annum on the project. So I think it's been, as Mary says, we have got a substantial amount of additional time because it's a new dynamics um, system that they're, they're, they've used for the project. Um, and we've had great success in working across departments and transferring data with other organisations, getting over some of those data protection issues that, that often um, stop us doing that, and then you know getting the information back again. So we would send referrals, for example, to Social Security um, Agency on a Thursday. They, the following week, they update their system on what's happened to those clients that we've referred, or they update who they can. They will have a, a time lag, maybe three or six months. But we get regular updates from all our partners um, on referrals that have been done. Thank you, Chairman. It's a positive yeah. story. Declan McAleer. Uh, thank, thank you. And the question was, was preempted. It was, it was for that ask about. Your interview does capture um, a lot of a lot of data, um, <coughs> and just just off from looking at it, obviously you got community health, transport issues, and even community safety, home safety stuff. So what you're saying is that that information can be shared with, say, DOJ or DRD or whatever to look at patterns, <coughs> not necessarily individuals, but patterns. Yeah, I think what, what we need to be very careful of is that we're not sharing individual data, um, and we won't do that. We have the consent of the households to share their individual data with organisations where we're making a referral on their behalf. So, for example, if we have to share some data with the Social Security Agency, we will agree with them beforehand. So the consent form lets them um, kind of nearly opt in or out of various parts of that, of that process. Um, so we, we have their consent to use their data for referrals to a range of organisations and we have um, their consent to use the their data for monitoring and evaluation purposes. Um, so there is a wealth of data there and I think if it's used in an anonymised, aggregated format, there, I don't see any particular reason. I think it's something we can just check around that, but I don't see any reason mm. in that been used for research, for mm. example, because it's, it's, it's anonymised, it's aggregated, and it would be in a format that wouldn't identify individual households. I think that's important, Chair, because I just noted even, uh, should have said there as well, you ask questions around broadband yep. and all as well. So if you're picking up a pattern of it in certain areas, yep. Will that be obvious, you know, and can be shared? Well, that's something that we will look at. It. That, that's what, you know, again, what we're happy to do if there's any particular issues or areas from the questionnaire that you would want us to interrogate yeah. in detail, we're more than happy to do that. I mean, we can we can do practically anything that's in there. We can get out of it in whatever format we can. So mm. I think we'd be happy to do that. If you, if you want to put individual questions up, we mm. can. As part of the evaluation process, we will be looking at a range of these, and certainly broadband is something that um, Dard had asked us to include in the original questionnaire, so it's something that we will include in our evaluation report. Yeah. That would be important. Uh, and uh, the, other, sorry, Chair, just, uh, the other question was, you made reference to the 198 uh, super output areas, rural super output areas. How, how, how do you define uh, where super, super output area is rural? Or otherwise, because this was something that was mentioned at the conference already, the chair, um, about what is a rural SOA yeah. and what isn't. Well, we took um, guidance from Nazra on that, really, and worked through what they had determined as being rural super output areas. So 
I think there was there's 286, if I'm right, in total. Um, we had a, originally gone under the first 88 of those. So what we did in 2008 to 2011, when we did the original project, we identified those most those areas that were identified as the most deprived in terms of rural areas, and went in there, did the project in those areas. But recognise that there's pockets of deprivation everywhere, so we can't just concentrate solely on those really deprived areas. So in phase two, we agreed that we would go into all the rural areas, um, and we would target. Um, Four households in those areas that had never been targeted, but we do we would do some more in the first 88 that we had gone into because we realised there was still issues of deprivation there. So really, in terms of what we've used, we've used the Nusra definition of of, of rural super output area yeah. and follow that. And I have to say, just on a point, Chair, and you probably agree with me, is that uh, we attended uh, we the committee organised the rural stakeholders meeting last week in Greenmount. And I have to say mm -hmm. that uh, the MAR project uh, came in for a lot of praise, uh, precisely because you take a community development approach and you do go up those long lanes and into those small uh, villages and hamlets to reach out to the most uh, vulnerable and isolated people in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the only other point I'd like to pick up on that is that I didn't mention the fact that although we are monitoring this data and we have done our own internal evaluation, we will also be adding to that by a, a, an external objective evaluation toward the end of the programme. So that will give us a degree of assurance and also a, a critical eye in terms of this programme and, and the, the benefits immediately, but also taking them into the future. OK. Oliver McMull. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for presentation. Can I congratulate you on the, the MARA project? Um, indeed, it has been getting a lot of praise from all sectors. And in my time uh, in, in the rural areas, this is the first programme that I've seen that has really went into the, the countryside and brought out the problems that's out there because uh, it's a well known fact that those people in rural areas are the last people to come forward to complain or to, to even let you know that there was a a problem with uh, isolation, uh, with anything at all, and, and they, there is that stigma of mental health, and, and they didn't never want that to be seen. But now that through your program, you've been able to, to get that out, that information out. So the information you have now sitting there is, is in my mind, a, a, a gold mine of information for other uh, strategy bodies now to feed into. And it's really now down to them to feed into that, to take up the baton that you have laid down to them to bring that information out. It can only be good for the future. And uh, I, I do hope that that information is taken up by the other statutory bodies and, and used to the benefit that, that, that's, that's out there. And there clearly is a programme of work out there for those living in rural, isolated areas that there, there is help needed. That has always been the question, and we now know the answer to it. So well done. Thank you. Well done. OK. Come on, yeah. uh, thanks, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, just looking at, at the figures in your presentation, um, there seems to be quite a, a difference between the number of visits and assessments and your targets in, in areas. Can you explain that a wee bit further, maybe? Because I'm just looking at... Uh, North Antrim Community Network, 1,642 initial visits. Uh, OMA, Forum for Rural Associations, just below it, 472. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be quite a different, probably an explanation, but tell me. Yeah, okay. I think it was just how we um, originally had to devise the zones. We, we could have ended up going out with probably 20 or 30 lead organisations to work on this, but I suppose we had to try and work in, on, uh, on the potential budget that we had for the project as well. And, and you're, you're quite right. When we grouped together um, the areas, there are some areas that have um, an extremely huge number of super output areas. So they would have ended up, for example, um, the likes of um, North Antrim, the likes of South Down, um, and also um, the Costa, that um, Dungannon are my area. So uh, what we did is we gave them... Um, we, really, we, we, we grouped the super output areas um, into zones, um, and then we allowed those areas that had more, a longer period of time. So it was to make sure that all the 198 areas that were covered, and rather than have 20 or 30 lead organisations with 
a potential you know, cost of having to have that staffed and run forward, we thought it would be best to try and contain how we did this. So, yes, you're quite right, some areas have more, but it was just, and it depends on the number of rural output areas, uh, and that's around an area, if that makes sense. So, we would have allowed them a longer space of time to do that. So, it's just the geography of that area, the population of the area, um, and then some, some zones would have operated for nine months, others would have operated for two years to ensure that they did all the super output areas in their area. It so meant uh, all the areas were covered. Does it really go down to the number of super output areas? Yeah, the super output areas, because what we, what we did do was we um, asked them to try and ensure as far as possible that they would visit 50 households in each super output area. So no area should be an advantage over the other, that each area would have the same number of households seen. And it's just the way that they were grouped um, together for, for our sure, system it, it, management. It might be project. useful in that case if we were to get a list, I know it's a bit laborious, but if we were to get a list of the super output Absolutely. areas, yes. yeah, they're yeah. readily available. So it would give us a better uh, understanding of those figures as, as to why. Yeah, and you know, we can give you a list under each of the zones. Yeah. So I can give you the zone and yeah. the list yeah. under them. That will be yeah. useful. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second question is around uh, your focus. Have you had a focus on any particular sector or age group? Uh, an old uh, colleague, Joanne, asked earlier about farmers, but yeah. I'm thinking more al along the, the lines of uh, people that, that live in small villages or in what I would call more rural areas or a focus on younger people. Has there been anything designed towards younger people? There's, there, there has been a number of yes, younger people have availed of the project, and again, uh, uh, the, the break-up and the detail of that will be become evident now when we analyse all the data on the systems. The last visit's only finished a few weeks back, I think, yeah. so we're really now just starting to really delve into the data of that. You know, a high proportion of users will be older people, um, but we have again asked and tried to ensure that the lead organisations are considering you know, the full range of target groups. So, you know, it's based on the target groups of the Tripsy project. So we're working with the range of groups that were identified in there, the ethnic minorities, lone parents, older people, carers, disabled people, lone adult households, farm families and low-income families. So there certainly is a proportion of, of young families as well. And some of the areas nearly are, um, have been very strong in that. South, um, South Down, for example, um, their, their work has been done through the... Um, South Down Family Health Initiative have led the work there and have been very strong on the younger people's agenda, but has, has, have you know also broken it into the other areas. So we will be able to tell you exactly how that looks when we do all the detail on that. But as a broad finding, it, it, there is an emphasis on older people. Okay. They tend they tend to be older people that are living on their own or elderly, you know, people living together. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Tom began. Uh, just following on from that last uh, question, there, you know, your focus has been on super output areas. Mm -hmm. You have said that the organisations were asked to visit 50 households within an area. How were those 50 households identified? Because you know, you go into a rural area, you're going to have a lot more than 50 households. So, how did you specifically identify 50 households that you were to, or that they were to visit, and and the others were well? Yeah. In want of a better word, they were all right. They didn't need a visit yeah. in a sense, and you had they had a focus in on fifty households. How did you identify them? Well, again, the identification was left to the local areas, but some of the guidance that we would have provided around that, and again, it's very difficult, and I think that's why at times um, the higher number of, of people who have availed to the project are older people because they're easily identified within a community. Um, but we would have said to them to kind of consider a number of, of criteria. So we, we guided them, but we had to, they had to make that ultimate decision. So we would have said things like, if you know, for example, that there's a lone parent there, um, and you, you understand from their personal circumstances they may have limited family support, you know, they might be somebody that you might want to, to visit. Um, and I, I would assume that there's some people there who um, we've missed because we, you know, like any other project mm -hmm. that you do, it's very hard to get everybody you need to get. And there's probably others who've maybe slipped in that maybe didn't really need to be there. Um, and that's the nature, I think, of the work at the local level. But certainly we had sort of guiding criteria, and that was how we, we did it, because it's very difficult for, for, all, for local people to know about every single person. And that was why we encouraged them to link with key members of the community that, that could help them do that. So if you're looking at that, they would have set down some of them in project teams. And would have tried to work through um, 
the households in their area. You know, they would have taken nearly a list of names that they would have known and they said that person and they prioritised from that. So it was really about them trying to work through and use that local knowledge. Um, it's not an exact science, I think, and that's yeah. the issue about this. It's not scientific in terms of how exactly it was done, but it was broad guidelines on how it was done. See each of your shipwright put areas. What what size would they have been in, in terms of population or households or whatever? They all varied, uh, again, depending on the density of that particular area. Mm. Uh, we, to be honest with you, have never actually had the figures aligned in terms of the population density, uh, in terms of the super output areas, but they would vary, again, right across. So there's probably some would have more than others, uh, because some super output areas would be very... Um, would not be very densely populated, where others might be a bit more. If you were near a village, for example, compared to if you were, in, you know, a very rural area, so there would have been a difference there. So we did, we did keep it consistent at 50. You know, and that might be something as we move forward. You'll be saying, right, maybe you should do less there, more there. You know, to take it in. And I think once we put it at 50 in each one, I think when we go to look at the data, we will find exactly that. Sometimes they've come back to us and said we can't find any more households than 30 in this area. So we've said. Do another 20 in an area where you know there's more demand or more need. So they've had to use that local judgment as well as they've gone forward. Mm-hmm. Okay. Back then, you're not running Chair, thanks for letting me back in again briefly. Um, the, see the, the, these, the question, these questionnaires, I'm guessing that these have been carried out from thousands of people. Yeah. That bear in mind that you've had over 10,000 first follow-up visits. Yeah. Um, see the information that has been gleaned, you know. Yeah. Um, has this been summarised, you know, on your IT system? It hasn't been. So we have reports that we would use for various elements to report back to DARD, for example. Uh-huh. Um, but the information hasn't all been summarised, but it could, could be summarised. And that's what, you know, we are more than happy to meet the needs of members and other and other um, partner organisations in terms of the taking this forward. So and it will also be part of the evaluation. evaluation. At the minute, what we're doing is uh, examining the big data and the big feedback that's coming at the interdepartmental forum mm. because we're using that actively while the program is t- still in delivery mode but we will also be analyzing all of this information as part mm. of the evaluation mm. so we don't have it all at the minute but as Colette we says we can certainly do a little bit more analysis but, yeah. but we will be doing it all all as part of the evaluation see i think chair that would be really really useful you know especially if you could break it down Per, per super output area. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be really, really informative for us to know what percentage of people in this particular super output area has a difficulty in access and transport or who own their own house or who have been... Yeah. Had we could do that. That we would be do really, really helpful. So would, area, um, I think, you know, because there's been so much work put into, into yeah. this this scheme, it would be, yeah. that would just be... Could, uh, some data have been lost or not used... To its maximum value, yeah. uh, you know, if it's not summarised in, in that way, you know, yeah. it would be really, really helpful. Yeah, certainly, and uh, we can certainly do that in advance of the evaluation. Uh-huh. I think we could try and get some high-level stuff, but it will not, it will form a very important part of the evaluation study. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Ian. All right, thank you, Chair. And I just want to say thank you for your presentation and add my voice of support to you as well. And well done to you. I just want to ask there, you know, for. Um, you know, as regards to referrals, um, do you have a particular you know, um, self-referral or is it referred on to, by, say, a local councillor or local representatives? It can come a number of different ways. It can be self-referral. It can also be through the GP or the social worker or the occupational therapist, although more likely to be the others, and the community organisations or on occasions other random people like as you said the postman it really does depend but there is self-referral available okay that's all uh, yeah well done yeah. to you thank you very much thanks sir okay well everyone um in relation to declan's question there and the uh, the evaluations you intend to do can we get a copy of those one yes so they're complete yeah. yes okay thank you for that uh, can we thank you again very much for your presentation and coming yes. to the committee? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Um, Chairman and members, okay. and for thank your you. support, obviously, through DARS and the joint working with Public Health Agency.
Ten item six, written briefing uh, toward avi the avian flu. Uh, can I refer members to the written briefing from the Department on Avian Flu, at pages 22 to 25? Can I also refer members to the addendum to the briefing note at page 24 of table papers? Members will recall that this briefing was requested last week in light of the outbreak of avian flu in England. Members will note that the briefing note outlines the actions taken by DARD to date. DARD will provide this committee with a written update on a weekly basis until the new year. We will review the requirement for a written update thereafter. Uh, any members want to comment? Are members are content to note the, the written briefing? Okay. Okay. Agenda item 7, correspondence. Can I refer members to the correspondence received at pages 28 to 33? Can I refer members to the request from Dairy UK to brief the committee on the issues uh, in the dairy uh, industry? There are two potential dates between now and Christmas. The 2nd of December would be the better of the two dates in terms of all the briefings. However, Dairy UK will now come back to say that the 9th of December would suit them better. Um, the difficulty I think with that is uh, we have a very busy schedule on the 9th. Right, Are members content to schedule the Dairy UK event for the 2nd? Um, yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense, okay. Members content to action correspondence is suggested on the index sheet at page 27. Okay. Chair, yeah, no, I have no problem with that. Just a query uh, to see the, the European uh, briefing. Can I ask just the status of the rural development programme as put forward by the department? Has that been approved at Europe? Not yet. Not yet. No, it's, it's Not yet. Them. Yeah. My understanding is that they expect comments back to DARD from Europe in mid January. Oh, mid January. And that we are expecting DARD to come back to this committee with what we're going to do now after we've okay. had the comments back from Europe in January, early February. So, more or less, as soon as they get it back and have assessed what they need to do. Okay. And will the operating rules come with that? Or is there usually a raft I'm not sure. I can check that for you. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. Agenda item 8, Forward Work Programme. Can I refer members to the Forward Work Programme at page 35 to 37? Can I ask members to note that the clerk has scheduled a short discussion on the 9th of December regarding the work programme uh, to Easter 15? Can I seek agreement for the Forward Work Programme? Indeed. Okay. okay. To agenda item nine, we have an oral briefing uh, from DARD on the budget 2015-16. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 41 to 45? Uh, papers from the department at page 6, 46 to 84. The lines of question and research paper at page 85 to 95. A further research paper on the draft budget 2015-16 on pages 97 to 103. And then the department's response to the AFP committee report on pages 104 to 107. Can you remind members that the deputy chairperson had a quick meeting with the minister on the budget last week? The minister's offered to come to the committee after the public consultation on the budget. Uh, can I remind members that the committee is expected to respond to the Finance and Personnel Committee against the themes outlined at pages 94 to 95, and we'll have a short closed session later to discuss that response. I'm therefore relying on members to ensure uh, that they ask the right questions to be able to inform an opinion on issues such as, as the Minister choosing the right priorities, what about the cost reduction plan for RDP, uh, the um, um, the fact that we're losing 300 staff in the core department is not doable. And what are the plans for AFP, Caffrey and Locks Agency? Many may wish to probe on these and other issues during the question and answer session. Can I welcome Noel Lavery, Permanent Secretary, Jerry Lavery, Assist Deputy Secretary, and Graham Wilkerson, Assistant Secretary? Uh, can I ask you to take up to 15 minutes to give your presentation? Uh, Chair, thanks, and I appreciate the time you give me. It is a imp very important issue, so I do appreciate the time. Uh, just uh, uh, some comments I'd like to make. So I uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chair and members, and brief the committee on the Department's 2015-16 uh, draft budget proposals. Uh, I do hope you've had the opportunity to consider the document. Uh, and I know you'll want to explore uh, this in some more detail with us. Um, if I could begin with an overview of the financial position and then go on to provide members an outline how we've approached the budget process 
the contents of the document and then the steps in the consultation uh, process. Um, in terms of the financial challenges uh, for us going forward, we're aware that the block grant from Westminster was reduced by 1.6% or £160 million pounds in the financial year. And alongside this, all government departments have had to absorb the impact of pay and price inflation over a number of budget periods, uh, and DARD hasn't been exempt from that, of course. Uh, as a consequence, there are material pressures across all departments, particularly given the high proportion of costs which relate to wages and salaries. Indeed, the Finance Minister highlighted in his draft budget that this has been constructed, the budget has been constructed in the most challenging financial circumstances to face any administration in the history of Northern Ireland. So that gives uh, some context to what we're discussing today. Uh, it's also important to note that the budget reduction faced by the blocks not, not a one-off reduction. Challenging times ahead, it's imperative we plan and design our business reflecting uh, that ever-reducing public sector funding. Uh, if we consider the projections by the Office of Budget Responsibility, and the Finance Minister referenced these in his statement to the Assembly, um, he said we are facing a real terms reduction of 13% or £1.3 over the three years to 2019. So, Chair, Chair, given this context, we're mindful of the extreme challenges in delivering savings in this context and how we will deliver ever more efficient services uh, with reducing resources. So, in terms of the approach, the Executive agreed the draft budget the 3rd of October, uh, launched their consultation the 3rd of November, responses due the 29th of December. We're working to that same timetable. Um, Chair, clearly the Executive faced very difficult decisions, and as the Minister has already stated, the Executive is making a considerable commitment to rural development and agriculture, and these proposals will afford us a basis of offering significant support to the sector. Continuing to sustain real, rural communities, high standards of animal health, meeting ambitions for a better environment and delivering business efficiently. And if I could emphasise a number of important points as a, in an overview that have influenced the draft proposals. There has been a long-standing weakness in DARD's budget, and as the Department has, and I know this committee will be very aware, dependent on topping up funding via in-year monitoring rounds. Therefore, we start with in-year pressures. Uh, the Executive has allocated almost £20 million funding up front for TP compensation and costs necessary are ensuring our European grants and subsidies comply with the Commission's requirements. Then there's a 30 million reduction in our baseline. These are all resource. And clearly, decisions have had to be taken. The Minister has stated she's determined to take a balanced and fair approach to finding these savings. The consultation document sets out that approach. The Minister has also indicated publicly she'll be making a strong case for additional funding align with the commitments already made by the Executive to deliver the RDP, implementing the going, uh, the executive's res implementing of the Executive response to going for growth and the relocation programme. So she's indicated she'll be making a strong case for additional funding, and that she's looking for the longer term on how we develop a more modern, leaner, more digital department. So in developing our approach, we've focused on protecting programme for government requirements, assigned to DARD, as well as delivering ex the Executive's agreement in the HQ relocation and cap reform, including the new going for the uh, rural development programme and going for growth. And these are reflected within uh, the section identifying key issues and challenges facing DARD. So just to summarise, um, the consultation document, three elements to it, the distribution of the 19.6 million that have been allocated, the allocation of the 34.4 capital funding, and that is, a, that is a good allocation of capital funding, and the savings proposals of 29.9 million. If I could begin with the savings plans, the 29.9 million, and these are summarised on page 28 of the document. Just So it's 29.9 million. If I could you just put this into context for members, 29.9 million would be 86% of AFP's grant and aid from the department. It would equate to 800 staff, 
it would be more than the entire match funding for the RDP. And it's nearly twice CAFRI's annual resource budget. That's just putting that into context of what that 30 million cut, if you looked at those individually on their own, would be. And as you will see from page 28, the document, the savings were broken into, into four categories. And if we consider, we, we looked at this firstly in the department's operating costs. This included all elements of running a department, including staff levels, estate, general running costs. And you'll see from the document that um, we've identified 3.7 million and 5.6 million as savings there in cost reductions and staff reduction. The majority of these would be delivered from staff savings. No doubt members will have questions about the voluntary exit scheme. Uh, when we've identified 5.6 million, that equates to a reduction of 300 staff halfway during the year. And if I could emphasise, um, we are taking management actions to reduce our staffing numbers. And then when the voluntary exit scheme comes on board, that would be offered to staff. So overall, we're saying, on average, we'd reduce our staff by 300 next year from where we are today. I'm sure members will have questions on this. Uh, the scheme is still being developed, and I believe a paper will go to the executive to try to address any queries that members have. Um, on income and, or revenue, in, in addition to reducing our costs, we've looked at opportunities to raise additional revenue. Again, at page 31, you'll have seen we've set a target of six million. Majority of this relates to EU funding we can, uh, we can apply for in respect of our TB eradication programme, and this would go a long way towards securing the target. Minister has also set an initial target of two, mission, two million additional income for AFP to generate. We're aware of AFP's earning potential and specifically the, opportun the opportunities in Horizon 2020. This will not be easy. There will be uh, obstacles in the way. But it's important that we seek to access alternative forms of funding, particularly given the projected reduction in expenditure which we are facing. This is, approach is consistent with the Barroso Task Force recommendations and the approach uh, set by the Executive in relation to EU priorities. The PAC hearing on AFP highlighted the uh, area of fees and charges, and AFP are examining this and seeking to benchmark their current rates applied to other organisations in these islands. And it may be that the charges currently applied may need to be uplifted to reflect the costs of delivering the service. If we come now to programme, so you know, in effect when we look at the table uh, of proposed savings, that deals with half of it. So then we come to programme monies. So having looked at cost reduction and income, we then have no choice but to go into programme. So having exhausted this, we looked at the, the programme area. Uh, Appendix 3 documents the savings across four main areas. Rural Development Programme, AFPI Work Programme, the Tripsy Programme and Animal Disease. In relation to the RDP, we'll be constrained in relation to the new schemes that we can open and when we can open. Uh, we will have to phase these. This is a budgetary management issue. We will, however, meet the cost of legacy schemes, uh, particularly in agri-environment. Uh, our costs under leader and the ANC scheme. And the Minister's allocated an initial one million of resource funding to deliver going for growth, and specifically around the, the farm business improvement scheme, and I'll say more under capital on that. Our current forecast is that we will not be able to open the new agri-environment schemes in 26, 15, 16, as we had planned. It is our plan to open those schemes. It's a question of when, and that will have to be phased, as I said. This is a budget remanagement issue. We're considering those elements of the AFP work programme that we are able to reduce. This is currently commissioned from DARD, the value of £42 million per annum, covering a broad spectrum of research and diagnostics services. Uh, given the scale of reductions we face, well, we say uh, our view is it's necessary to reduce this by £3 million. This would equate to approximately 7% of the work that DARD commissions. We'll keep the committee advised of this. This is a, a, a challenging uh, scenario for AFP, and we're very aware of that. On TRIPSI, we've considered how best to de deliver the programme given the constraints on our resource funding. And the Minister is therefore uh, proposing a rebalanced programme 
of 4.7 million, which is the same as the value of the current programme, but with 1. Point million moved from resource to capital, uh, and the minister will uh, be put. There will be options for that in terms of how that programme is finalised. This will ensure funding remains in place, and we're spending on a high proportion, higher proportion in capital schemes, and, and as I said, those are being developed. The department has also re reviewed its animal disease programme, where savings of up to 0.8 million may be achieved, and lower priority services reduced or ceased. The imminent move to officially brucellosis free status should assist on this. Uh, there's more details on the savings and the potential impacts in Appendix 3 of the document. Members will appreciate we're still at the early stage in terms of some of the in consideration of some of these impacts, and more detail will be available as those develop. Um, I referenced the uh, 19.6 uh, million of allocations. Uh, those are on page 16 in Table 2 of the document. Um, as a reference, this committee will be aware of the structural deficits in the DARD budget. I'm sure you've seen Graham Wilkinson come forward at monitoring rounds referencing TB compensation, investment in LIPIS, uh, and uh, issues around disallowance. The proposed table at page two and, uh, and sorry, table two on page 16 reflects the need to address these issues. This is vital for how we plan a budget. Uh, the uncertainty we have had is extremely difficult on how we plan, and uh, that's um, not good for DARD. It's certainly not good for stakeholders. The minister is proposing to take one mil million pounds of this as an initial uh, allocation, also towards a farm business improvement scheme. We'll make that point to the finance minister when she meets him. This will take forward training, workshops, business planning to prepare to prepare farm businesses for their uh, decision about capital investment. Uh, I referenced earlier the capital allocations on page 18 and 19. Uh, the proposed allocations are 34.4 million to DARD. This is, this is a reasonable allocation for the department. It's above our current year, yes, significantly above our current year. Number of factors in terms of how the minister has allocated this, looking at our policy priorities, deliverability within the constrained timescale, and the degree of existing commitments. As we're all aware, Chair, a one-year capital budget, it, it's not great for planning, but it is where it is. As you will see from Table 3 on page 19 of the document, we've categorised these into programme funding, IT systems, recurring capital. The allocations allow us to progress our programme for government commitments on the HQ relocation programme, as well as the capital elements of the new RDP, including those relating to going for growth. This is a significant allocation of eight and a half million for flood alleviation and provide two million pounds to upgrade drainage infrastructure assets across the region. There's about three quarters of a million to, com to complete the standalone element of the East Belfast flood alleviation scheme and four million for flood alleviation works that have been integrated with phase two of the Greenway project in East Belfast. The balance relates to smaller capital spends and uh, is uh, there for members. The IT allocation of seven million will allow us to implement the technology needed, absolutely vital to upgrade our processing systems, ensure our customers are able to engage with the department re remotely in the future, and it's a vital part of our plans for a leaner, more digital DARD. We will have targets to deliver more of our services online to facilitate farmers who can't access our, our office services, which are conducted nine to five. And we also anticipate resource savings by investing in technology. Mr Chairman, the Minister has secured from the Executive significant additional resource funding and capital allocation. She's already said we'll seek further funding for going for growth. However, there are very significant cuts being imposed in the Department. Difficult decisions will be having to be made. In making these proposals, the Minister intends to be true to commitments she has made and priorities she has set, building for the future, supporting the vision for the agri-food sector, developing a leaner, more digital, efficient department, and directing resources to high-priority programmes and, ser and services. I know she will value the views of this committee. Mr Chairman, that concludes my introductory remarks. Appendix 5 summarises consultation questions. We thought it would be helpful we just, uh, to focus on the key issues. Um, 
Following this session today, we we'll formally launch the consultation document seeking views from the public statutory section 75 consultees and meeting the range of stakeholders to capture views. As I said earlier, the process ends on the 29th of December with views sought in advance of a final budget being presented to the Executive. At this stage, a formal date for that consideration hasn't been confirmed. However, we expect that to be in early January. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. And certainly, uh, there's some ahead. Uh, first of all, Dart are expecting to raise approximately six million uh, in additional revenues uh, in regard to Appley I'll be targeting uh, external resources. Um, that would be quite unsure how certainly that I'll be able to raise that sort of capital. Um, sorry, Chair, there's of, of the six million, four million is uh, on EU. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. So, uh, and two is, is from Appy. Okay, uh, two million from Appy, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah absolutely uh, right, Chair. This is a, a challenging target. Uh, however, as I referenced, um, the executive has set its EU priorities and the Brussels task force that we should be uh, accessing more, uh, specifically from Horizon 2020. Um, I have made me aware of how challenging this will be, but in the direction of travel we're going, we, are, we do need to seek uh, additional income from non-mainstream Dell resources. Uh, AFPI, and again, this came out at the Public Accounts Committee, AFPI have been very successful in growing their external income, and I think that they should be congratulated on that in the past, but I have no doubt on the challenges that we'll face. Well, if you think about it, £2 million pounds is about equivalent to, say, 50 jobs, and really the, the issue facing AFPI is would you cut 50 jobs or would you try and grow your way out of the problem by bringing in additional income? And, and frankly, we're setting the bar at you know, increasing the income, aggressively going looking for, for new work, taking EU receipts in. That's where we think their future lies. It lies in expanding. It lies in you know, trying to compete with other similar institutions across Europe and win the business. It doesn't lie with downsizing and just cutting your way out of trouble. OK, I think, yeah, I understand that really well. I think it is a challenge, but it will be interesting how that works out. Uh, regarding the uh, staff productions of 300 uh, staff on 75.6 million, can this money be saved in the 2015-16 year? Um, Again, I mean, Chair, maybe if it just, if it, if it, if it, we should have said at the outset, all these plans are challenging. These plans are very, very challenging. The department has delivered on its savings plans in the past, but, but these are challenging. Um, number of factors. In seeking to do this, we are seeking to aim to get a balanced budget. Uh, that's why we're having to reduce our staffing levels. That's one. Two, we need to re-engineer re our business model, given the longer-term financial position. We will drive down the we we will drive down our staffing numbers by other means, as I indicated. The number of the amount of the staff reduction would depend on the number of staff who actually apply to a scheme. But this is the target we have set ourselves in seeking to balance the budget. We basically said we need to be 300 staff less than we are today. That's how, we, that's how we've done it. This will be very challenging in terms of running the business and re-engineering the business, but this is a first step on a road that we'll be for the next five or six years. What percentage of your role staff is that? We're currently around 2650, so it's about 10%. Yeah. So have you decided what areas they're going to come from within the department? or? Yes. Each, um, each business area has been set a, a target, a 10% staff reduction target, uh, so it's right across the department. We don't have detailed plans for all of the department, but yes, we, we're doing right across. Um, so there's one thing I would have to say, Chair, um, when a scheme like this, if a scheme and it's a voluntary exit scheme, anyone can apply. So there will be you know, significant churn 
and movement from within the business. But yes. Anything else, Jerry, on that? No, I think, I mean, obviously there are some areas of work that you can predict are coming to an end. The uh, Minister is still committed to the eradication of brucellosis. With that eradication, there will be less of a need for testing. Exactly how much less has to be determined by policy, but there will be posts there. The services won't be required any longer. Um, but a, a minute, for instance, in many, many stops, hey. Doing brucellosis testing, have you any idea? No. There's about 50 staff there at the moment. Okay. Um, but whether you would go down to, I mean, you're not going to go from brucellosis testing to no brucellosis testing. That would risk, you know, ignoring a potential problem. Um, so there, there are issues in there where some work will cease, but more generally, we will be bearing down on, on business areas and, and looking to, to people to come up with new ways of working. New ways of delivering service. Um, okay. Uh, will will Dard be or will Afby be free to bid for work themselves? Yeah. They get, they give that freedom to do that. Yes. And Afby uh, are. I mean, as I said in my opening remarks, they're looking at their cost, their cost model. But yes, there's no impediment from from Dard. I mean, I suppose the only impediment is their own resources. Yes. And again, as I said, we, we'll have to look at our own programme and cutting our own programme, which would free up resources. Yeah. Tom Elliott. Tom. Hey, Chair, thank you. <coughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, sorry. Um, you did mention 29.9 million savings plans. Is that what, it, what actually the, the amount is? Because it's 15.1%, or how did you come to that figure? I, I didn't think Dard had a cut of 15.1%. All right. Um, I think the headline figure was 5.2. 5. 5. Yeah. 5. Yeah. We've been allocated mm. at 19.6, and mm. yes, the sorry. finance minister said what he had allocated the 19.64, and then we have to make a £30 million pounds cut. So yes, the net of those is you know ten point three three million. But again, um, it goes to my, my earlier point. Dard has had a structural problem in its budget for years. <coughs> I mean, as I said, this this committee will have seen in year um, coming for bidding for TB compensation, not being sure we were going to get it during the year. Sorry to cut across you there. No, okay. is, is that is that mainly what you got? Uh, and the uplifts is the, the TB compensation? Yes, three things. TB compensation, money for disallowance, and money for investment in our LIPAS systems. Graham, you got the breakdown? Yeah, it's on page 16 of the document, uh, table 2. It sets yeah. it out. So TB compensation 7.3, cap disallowance 5, our uh, cap reform programme 6.3, and going for growth. So you're agreeing to meet all those uh, in year now, without it, any... We're, so we're basically... <coughs> Yes, um, the finance minister has recognised that that's a structural deficit in the Dard budget. Is dealing with that. Um, I think he'd be surprised if we came forward looking for in-year bids for it. So we're saying let's deal with that structural deficit. Then we've got thirty million pounds. So how are we going to of a cut? How are we going to deal with that? That's been our approach to it. Okay, so try to. Just to want clarity on this. You will not be then bidding in the monitoring rounds for TV compensation. No. Nope. You're going well, to take that out of your mainstream. Well, well, as you know, the, the disease is a very volatile disease, so we have £12.2 million whenever we add that to our allocation. However, should the incidence of TB actually increase, we may need to come back and review that. So, yeah. but, but it's a much better position than we have been previously. Right. Uh, so you're effectively, you're effectively taking that out. Uh, and any real chance, unless there's a, a huge increase, yes. you're effectively taking that, what I would call it almost a, a block grouping to the, yeah. uh, to the monitoring rounds for TB compensation out. Yes. And, and you're going to suffer that loss in, in, in house. You're going to accept those reductions in house and other areas? Well, we're accepting that that's a cost that we can't plan for. We're, we're taking action to reduce uh, TB compensation, but it's a long term thing. It's been an uncertainty in the budget. 
And if you again, if you get into the staffing numbers, Tom, you know, and I'm trying to plan for staff in their future. I, I need to be able to know that I have those structural issues dealt with in the budget because they recur every year. They haven't been in this department's baseline uh, for, and, and they are real costs to the department. So I think it's the right way to, to, to deal with it, and absolutely um, you know, welcome finance minister's proposals there. Yeah, but my point is, I need clarity in all this, my point is that you um, are accepting that TB compensation hit from your mainstream budget. Not right. We're bu we're budgeting for TB compensation within our within our budget. Yeah. Yes. And not getting additional allocation resources for it. Not in year. Un unless. Yeah. Unless, unless something. Uh, okay. No. Um, there was a hundred million pounds funding from the executive. I, I noticed in there somewhere uh, for workforce restructuring. It's called. Yeah. I'm assuming that's staff reductions. Yes. Please wouldn't just call it that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, small person like me, uh, the ordinary person, uh, but that's staff reductions. How much of that would you expect coming to Dard? Um, are two elements to that. I'll bring I'll bring Jerry in uh, or Graham in, in in a second, but just two elements to that. There'll be that a hundred million is set aside to seek to fund. Staff reductions in the Northern Civil Service and arm's length bodies. So it has to stretch a fair bit. Um, we uh, would be bidding for whatever our, our number of staff who would go for it, but let, let's assume it was a, a large element of the 300 and whatever AFP would bid for, because AFP will. will I have already been talking to us about the need for staff reductions. I don't have what the cost of that would be, Graham. No, well, I mean, we don't know the terms of, of the scheme or, yeah. or even the terms that would be applicable to individual members of staff. So until we have certainty around both the terms and the numbers, uh, we won't know the actual cost of that. There, I mean, there have been numbers in the press, I know, in terms of the civil service, of about, you know, over 3,000 civil service staff. Um, but again, as I said, it would be the civil service and arms length, arms length bodies. So we'd be bidding into it, you know, for the equivalent of 300, up to 300 staff plus AFP. And you have uh, 5.6 million in your current reductions. That is the that is the the existing staffing cost to us of 300 staff in Dard for six months. For six months, sorry, Jerry. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, just one quick question, Chair. Did you ever think of a single inspection mechanism between DAR, DOE, and NAEA? I think that the Minister's made reference to um, uh, rationalising and looking at our ins inspection regime, uh, certainly within DAR. Um, that's one element. Oh, sorry, give me a couple of goes at, this, at your question. Um, within Dard, I mean, the farmer will get a number of visits from people in Dard, vets, inspectors, uh, and we're looking at how we do that internally and some restructuring and how we do that. Uh, the minister has actually raised the issue about um, us and the NIA, and I think that's something we'll have to look at. That's as far as it's gone. This stage, we're we're. Progressing it internally first within DARD in terms very of very slow, very slow. Um, it's a few years from in this committee, and they were talking about it. Still mm -hmm. talking about it. Well, I mean, I can say we're looking at structural changes which would uh, impact this in DARD. Yeah, not hold my breath. Thanks, Chair. Joe Bourne. Yes, Chair. Again, I welcome the presentation in relation to the policy objectives by the Minister. Yes. Now, what is of course cut? Um, obviously, the headquarters relocation is a priority. Does the headquarters relocation offer you the opportunity, therefore, to seek 300 redundancies? Is that the intent? Mm, 
I'll bring Jerry in on that, but no, two completely separate. Joe, Joe? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the relocation programme is indeed a commitment by the Minister and um, a, implements a decision of the Executive. We always anticipated that we would uh, have a big um, swap of staff who are currently doing posts um, that are scheduled for relocation with staff who are in both our department and other departments who are resident in the areas that we are relocating to. Um, we are increasingly confident we can do that um, and do it without a, a loss of service. Um, we do not see it as, a, as part of the, the um, planned action to um, reduce the, the number of posts in the department. Um, obviously, in, in the course of things, yes, people will vacate posts and people will move into posts, and there may be some of those uh, movements that leave a post vacant and will consider its future at that point. But if, if you bear in mind that uh, our objective is to transfer jobs to these areas, we do not want to see a, a large loss of jobs uh, from the groups that we are moving. So we actually have an interest in sustaining the number of jobs that we move. In relation to the quantum of 300, are you hoping to achieve that within a year by a voluntary scheme? And therefore that begs the question, how many of your staff are over 60? Um, if you sure you may have offended Mr Lavery, am I right? Um, uh, He's got that age in life, he doesn't worry like me. Um, <laughs> I know over 55. I know over 55, Chair, that there's about 720. I don't know over 60. Um, sorry, the first element of your question was: Are we are we trying in, in the one year? Yes. Um, answer: Yes. Very and that will be very challenging. Yes. It'll be so, in other words, if you're going to try and achieve it within the one year, you have to get some of the 100 million set aside by the NICS. To yes. The, the initial cost of early retirement. And yes, uh, the cost of the ISA scheme. And other departments will be taking the same approach. So the 5.6 million is referring to the, the half year wages? Yes. That would be saved, OK. Yes. One other question. In relation to the cut in the rural development programme, have you broken down where the 9.0 million is spread across and also then the agri environment scheme? One million is, is that right? Um, how much are you proposing to cut the agri environment scheme or by how much are you hoping to save by not having it? Sorry. Um, in terms of s saving, if, if I can explain to you um, what we are spending the money on, to, our, um, we'll be spending, our estimate is that we've got about £8 million on legacy agri environment schemes, the existing ones. Um, we spent about £2 million on leader. About eight million pounds on uh, ANC and one on going for growth. That's what we see as currently affordable. Um, so th that is the national element only. I'm referring to. So, uh, sorry. So sorry, just those figures you know. So on the legacy issues or the ongoing schemes, you've got eight million. Committed, yes. Eight million committed. Is that right? Eight million on legacy agri environment. Um, I'm looking to Graham on my left. I'm hoping I'm giving you the right number. Mm -hmm. um, two million on two million on leader. Um, that's ongoing leader as well. Is that right? No, that's yeah. new. No, that's, that's new. new. That's yeah, new. Right. And uh, eight million on ANC, and those are the national element. As I said, as I said to you earlier, I mean, I, again, I couldn't emphasise enough. Given the scale of these reductions. You're left with no choice but to eat into your programmes. Um, there's a there is a related point here. It is it is eating into our match funding for the RDP. Uh, this is a concern for us, uh, and this is a point that we'll be making at the bilateral. Thanks, Chairman. The only thing I would say is obviously the primary focus of the department is to service the needs of the farming industry and the agri food sector going forward. So the question is, those sort of cuts there in relation to what you outlined, 
Uh, does that cut into the productive capacity of the industry? Uh, I'll say, Joe, in terms of our, our commitment to the overall rural development programme, we are still committed to delivering the $623 million. Um, so it is really about phasing. So we are intending to, to deliver on, on those, those commitments. So it shouldn't impact on any plans that uh, the industry had going forward. Thank you. That's fine, Chairman. Go on, Dobson. Thanks, Chair. Um, the administration cost within the department has risen from £40 billion pounds in 2011-2012 to £42 million in 2014-15, despite your, your targets to cut administration red tape. And all of us here around this committee know that every farmer feels in a stranglehold with red tape and bureaucracy. So firstly, can you clarify why is this? Um, surely, surely you realise at a time of tighter budgets and greater administration, that greater administration rather than slim down administration process, make it harder, so much harder, and not easier on our, on our rural communities. So can you then explain what increased administration costs, uh, the increased administration costs are? I'll, I'll bring on my colleagues in uh, in a second, whoever wants to on the detail of the admin costs. I mean, I guess the point I would make would be delivered and receiving delivery plans Reducing our staffing budgets by 300, that's a significant strain uh, on a department. And so administration costs in this department will be significantly lower in 12 months' time, necessarily. But I'm just on the... Uh, but I'm talking... Uh, no, I, know, I don't understand. That's why, that's why I'm either... Well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, the figures, but what I would suggest is that, is that the... Um, in, in a sense, you make the point very well for bearing down on the staffing level. Now, over half of our costs, our resource costs, are in staff, and at the present time, staff costs increase both because there is pay inflation, there are changes to pension arrangements at national level that impact on us as an employer. So we see staff costs increasing all the time. And we have a difficulty, obviously, in reducing staffing until we get the voluntary exit scheme in place. That would be one of the major components in getting um, an inflation element to, you, to the administration costs. So what we want to do is reduce our staffing level, reduce our administration costs, and bring on um, a, a target operating model which is more efficient and has more online services that are more automated and that therefore will be cheaper for us but also cheaper for farmers and other users and more effective for them. Surely the fact that you've had more staff and you're now having to cut the staff is the fact that it's over bureaucratic, there's so much red tape. That's something from I have been on this, this committee and you hear constantly the farmers are bogged down and tied down with red tape and bureaucracy. Those additional staff obviously that were needed, in your opinion then, to administer the over bureaucratic systems that were set in place? Without conceding the over bureaucratic point, um, we would suggest that um, there has been some increase in our staffing, uh, which you would expect when you're implementing CAP reform, when you're implementing a new rural development programme and which even Noel planning said a few for weeks it. Ago will be even more bureaucratic going forward than new CAP reform. Some of, some of the schemes are being introduced, for example, the replacement of the single farm payment. You know, inevitably, if you're going to have a greening payment, if you're going to have a, a uh, young farmer's payment, uh, all of those add to the, the weight of administration. Our response to that is to try and become more efficient and more effective, and that's what we're going to have to do to reduce our staffing down. So we are responding, but not, not a big surprise that we have, in terms of implementing cap reform, had to grow our staffing for a short period of time. We'll now have to, to push it back down. So you're finally waking up to every farmer in the country has known for years that you need to work on your, your, your bureaucracy, your red tape and your, your administration. I, I did note, I think, Noel, you had said that the Minister is looking at a modern, leaner, more digital department. 
So yeah, well, she said that in public. Yeah, I know that. So obviously there has been a lot of work and it has been known for years how over bureaucratic it, it's been. Um, another point, if I may, Chair, in relation to the budget cuts, can you explain um, if there will be reductions in allocation for the headquarters relocation project, or is that to remain untouchable? Because a note at point 66 on page 69, you talk about scaling back programmes, raising additional revenue, and taking forward cost reduction measures. So is the headquarters relocation project in that, other than staffing, or will that remain untouchable? <coughs> headquarters relocation project uh, remains as, as it was, it's a, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a capital program, and the allocations outlined uh, in the document. I, mean, I think the minister uh, sort of said, in the, said in the, emphasised that point uh, in the media yesterday. It's a program for government commitment, and it's set out as the capital allocation there. Just untouchable then. Um, finally, you talk at point 66 again about keeping in mind um, your quotes the needs of rural dwellers and farming communities. Mm -hmm. So, whose needs will be put first? Those are the farmers, those are the department, because I'm quite concerned by your phrase kept in mind. Mm -hmm. Whose needs are first, the farmers or the department? Well, I think as I, as I sought to, to say, as I, as I went through in terms of how we've addressed the cuts and the dealing with the, the 29.9, Firstly, we've looked to the staff and the administration. Uh, we've looked at our internal cost reduction. We've looked at maximising revenue before we have had to come to programme, and programme uh, being you know, programmes for rural dwellers and for the, for the uh, uh, farming community. So, I think that would be my, my response to to your point. So you're putting farmers first. No, well, is that yeah. what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is, it's it's after we've got to those areas that we've gone into the programmes. So after you look after the department, then you're looking after the farmers? No, no, after we've made the cuts. So what I'm saying is we've, we've sought to make the cuts where we could in administration before we've touched the programme. I think that's quite right. I mean, if, if we had done, taken the other approach and gone to the programme first, I think you could write rightly of challenges and, and looking after ourselves. So just trying to tease us out, and Chair, I should have declared at the start, my husband's a beef and cereal farmer, as, as you well know. Keeping in mind, then, the needs of the rural dwellers, what exactly do you mean by keeping in mind? As I, as I said, taking cuts on the department, then trying to protect programmes. That's, that's what I'm saying, trying to protect the programmes. Sought to protect the rural development programme. Minister has, will be with Minister Hamilton, uh, some of the money that's been allocated, putting that to going for growth, <coughs> uh, putting money aside for the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. Uh, money Minister has prioritised ANC as part of her allocation and prioritised later. I mean, those, those are the programmes that she's prioritised. So are the farmers a priority for the department? Yes. Yes. Thanks, John. Edward Pitch. Thank you. These gentlemen are really just implementing Tory cuts in, on the poor farming community, which has been compounded then by Sinn Féin's spending on welfare, which, which means uh, the rural community will suffer even more. Um, however, in terms of it, you are looking at delivering efficiencies and you're deliver, looking at delivering savings, and there's a difference between the two. So what are the efficiencies? Efficiencies are in the Stafford cost reduction and we're seeking to increase revenue. And where are those staff? Yeah, right across the right across the board. It'll be right across the department, Mr. Boots. Mm. In terms of inspections, what 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 are you looking at doing in terms of inspections to make them more efficient? Well, there was a point raised earlier. Um, we're looking at and the minister said us a challenge here. Um, we're looking at actually internally how we do it. Um, we have said within veterinary inspections, conscious uh, inspections, cross compliance, etc. So we're we're looking at restructuring to see how better we can uh, reduce those, make those efficient. We do have an obligation, as you'll be aware, uh, for inspections mm -hmm. under EU regulations, and we will uh, continue to do those. And in terms of cross compliance inspections, 
Uh, is it your intention to bring it all in house, and can you legally bring it in house? You mean? Well, NIA yeah. currently conduct inspections. No, we, we look at how we work with NIA. I think that but sets can, your point. Can you do that? Can you bring it into the Department of Agriculture so that it's not uh, not agriculture that has to? Uh, Mexico's redundancy is its, its, its I, environment. I actually, actually don't know the answer to that one, Mr. Pitt. I'm hmm. very right. surprised you haven't checked that one out. I, I don't know. In, right. In, in terms of protecting your own staff, in terms of that as well, does it require two people to come out and carry out one inspection? Are you citing an, an example? No, that's, that's, that's not an example, that's, that's what's done. So you send two people out to carry out a farm inspection. Does it require two people to carry out a farm inspection? As I said, we'll be looking at all areas of efficiency, of efficiency. within the department. Yeah. Um, in terms of them services, uh, obviously we have a policy of going for growth. And uh, that goes beyond the Department of Agriculture and that is heavily involved in going for growth. And there are many opportunities to create employment and shift the balance from the private sector or from the public <coughs> sector to the private sector in terms of job opportunity. Is everything that you do um, going to seek to ensure that you don't diminish in any way what the department's doing in, in terms of its support for going for growth and ensuring that it's implemented? Um, because that'll be cuts as opposed to efficiencies. No, no, I understand, understand the point you're making. Um, I suppose a couple of points there, and I'll, I'll bring others in if they want, want to come in. 15% um, is a big cut. Which, which whichever, cut, yes. Which, whichever, way, whichever way you look at it. Yeah. Um, it will impact on all areas of the department. Um, this department has not had any allocation specifically for going for growth in the past. Um, the Minister is of the 19.6 million, she's going to allocate a million pounds to that. We put some money into capital schemes. It will form a core part of our policies. The Minister has said that uh, going forward. Um, but we haven't been allocated mm -hmm. any funding. The Executive said under the Farm Business Improvement Scheme they would give priority consideration up to £250 million pounds for that. Yeah. But is, is it an, a priority for the Minister? Absolutely, yes. OK, I, I think you have set aside funding for the new computer systems, and that would include the EFIS system, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And that would include recurrent funding, as opposed to capital funding? That would be the... Because you have to task people to, to, to work with the organisations to develop that, so so there's money coming out of recurrent funding for that. Yes, some of that would be some of that yeah. would be capital, some of it would be a resource. Could you remind me just how much this new computer system is going to cost? My finance man on my left. Uh, the total amount of capital investment uh, for the, the new system is 25.8 million. Uh, that includes capital for the existing mm -hmm. AFA system. As well as uh, as uh, the new uh, the new NIFA system that they are currently procuring, and then there's a considerable fund on top of that for for current spending, wasn't that right? Yes, there's about twenty eight point three million pounds. Twenty eight point three million over a period of time. Uh, I think that's out to twenty five twenty six, so it's mm -hmm. quite a number of years. Like. Yeah, and how much did the original system cost? I don't have the, the, those figures. I mean, that, the AFIS was implemented a yeah. significant time ago. We've had a little meeting previously as a fraction of that. And, and we've been told that we'll have to go out and tender for a new system because of some procurement rules. Yes. And yes. When, when, so so, when so you're, you're suggesting back. to me that we should be spending... Was that? 25, 25 million, million on capital. That we should be spending over £50 million pounds at a time whenever we're cutting everything. To, to actually adhere to some procurement rule because we couldn't extend a contract for a system which is still fit for purpose and will be fit for purpose for a considerable period. I think there's a couple of points that I, I'd like to make there. First of all, the um, existing system, um, there is a, a substantial risk and an increasing risk now of legal challenge on the procurement issue, absolutely correct. And 
therefore we, we would be at risk of losing substantial sums of money. Fifty people. million. It, it could be of that order, since we have said that's what a replacement contract is. So, secondly, however, if that were the only issue involved, um, we probably would not be winning this amount of money in competition with other departments. However, uh, we looked at the opportunity presented by a new system. And first of all, the existing AFIS system um, may be fit for purpose in the sense that it works as a standalone system. It is no longer capable of being integrated with the department's other systems. We need the new system to integrate with the other systems and to give farmers a joined up service. But importantly and thirdly, the new system offers us the opportunity to make substantial savings in our back office and to uh, deliver some of the job reductions that we are talking about here. The extent of the savings that we are looking for out of the programme are for the order of 18 million. So we will get a very substantial <coughs> saving, as will farmers, from the new system. Okay, so that's 53 take away 18. The 53 million, I think, includes an element of optimism bias. <coughs> yes, that includes 61 per cent optimism bias. And can you give us an assurance that uh, it won't exceed 53 million? With an optimism bias of 61 per cent, it would be reasonable not to expect it to exceed 53 million. Can I make, can I make well, those words are recorded in Hansard? You, know, you may well be now retired, Mr. Lowry, at that point in time. But, but I have no intention of retiring before you call me to account. <laughs> well, it's been well for the systems in place now. But, uh, so can, I, can I make a couple, sorry, couple, 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 sorry, make a couple of other points? Um, I'm not sure which Mr. Lowry was retiring there. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah. But the procurement issue. Can I be retired before it's called? Yeah, can I can't never mind you. No, but you mean you made a, you made a point about about procurement. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a there is a legal issue here, uh, and an important legal one. And just to give you an assurance, consider that very carefully before I <coughs> uh, decided to, to go with a, an open procurement that we are going with. It also, is this is an aged system. Uh, this is a an. A very aged system. Uh, Jerry has recalled to me on a couple of occasions on the flood in Dundonald House, uh, AFIS being down for what three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, you know, export trade depends on this working. So it was but no system will withstand a flood. No, but I'm, ju I'm, I'm making the point. No, it doesn't get rivers agency to, to, to clear rivers. Uh, well, yeah, okay, fair, fair comment. The water fair comment. But my point is, it's an important system for trade as well. Uh, so there are significant risks in not investing in this. We're, we're making our case. Uh, DFP will require DFP uh, to sign off on the final business case. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think I suggested to people previously that there should be more work done within the department in developing the system, uh, because we have witnessed previously ESNI. <coughs> Indeed, the planning service bring companies in to deliver these systems, and uh, the finance just running completely out of control. As was the case in the, the National Health Service when they spent twelve billion on the system, it didn't work. So, uh, I think fifty-three million is far too much to be spending in the first instance. Uh, if that was the end of it, that might be, you know, something which is acceptable to some people, if, if not to me. Uh, but I have a fear that there will be, be more. That's in the health as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's your reference. Thank you. Okay. Declan McAleer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I noted in your in your report that there's there's could be a change to the balance of funding for the, the Tripsy programme 2015-2016. And obviously from certainly from the meeting we, we attended last week, I was noted that things like the assisted rural travel and the Mara and um, of the other schemes will be kind of more resource oriented. I'm wondering what impact will, will you know, increasing the capital as opposed to resource have on the implementation of the trip tree program? Um, well, there's a couple of things. Um, one, it's a program for government commitment. The minister wants, wants yeah. to keep that. I mean, there is a potential that the capital element provides more sustainable investment, given the, the uh, pressure on recurrent costs. So you have investment in capital assets. Uh, investment in infrastructure, 
Um, so the minister's asked for you know, some advice just on how she rebalances that programme, and that will be finalised shortly. So, I mean, it may be that actually um, Pauline Keegan or her colleagues would come and present to the committee once the minister's finalised that. But I do think there is a potential for more sustainable investment, I think. And um, the other point I want to make was um, I note that the cut-off date for the consultation is the 29th of December, and bear in mind that's just over a month away, and we've got Christmas holidays. Is that sufficient time for serious engagement with the main stakeholders? I'm conscious that it's a shorter time scale than one would have liked, and where there would have been uh, on the previous budgets. About the 2010-11 budget but it was short. Um, it's, it's important. Uh, we would have liked longer. It, it is what it is. It was based on the executive agreement. Um, I'm, I think we're one of the earlier departments out. Yeah. Um, and ministers uh, keen to engage with stakeholders and has tasked us with doing that as well. Yeah. Just to add to that, Declan, we are keen to hear from, from stakeholders. Yeah. So we have, whilst we are working towards the executive's uh, timetable of the 29th of December, we have extended the consultation out to the 18th of, of February. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will allow us to take views from, from stakeholders to, to help us mm -hmm. inform our, our policies on our uh, funding decisions going forward. So it might not, it won't inform the, the executive paper, but we are still interested in hearing from stakeholders. Just repeat that again, the 18th of February. Right. We're keeping the consultation open until right. the 18th of February, so whilst there is that deadline of the 29th of December to inform the executive's uh, paper, we still want to hear from, from stakeholders we have given them additional time. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tom again. Thank you, Chairman, and apologies for being out at question time there. But over the past three years, DARDS and admin costs have, have increased by some £2.7 million. Pounds. Can you give us some... Um, reason why this happened? I mean, I, I was saying earlier that I think the, the main component is going to be the inflation uh, in pay and the extent to which our admin costs are composed primarily of staffing. And staffing costs go up because um, public servants uh, have an entitlement to pay progression, uh, so they get an increment. As they, as they go through the, the different stages of their career. Um, and that means that there's a built-in uh, inflation every year in cost. And really, you know, the, the issue in front of us as a department is to reduce our staff costs significantly now. The opportunity is there to do that with the voluntary exit scheme that the executive is, is bringing forward. Um, we're going to participate in that to the fullest extent that we can. Uh, while still delivering services, and uh, that should reduce our administrative costs considerably. Okay. Another issue that I had was: uh, Will DARD now allow greater flexibility for AFP uh, to bid for work? Because we know that the current model that they, they work from at the moment makes them in, um, competitive. So, you know, will they be given greater freedom by DARD to uh, bid for further work? A um, couple, couple of points. Uh, make. Um, we're certainly not seeking to, to limit AFB in bidding for work. And in fact, the Minister has set them a, a target um, to do so. Uh, however, the, the Public Accounts Committee were, were very clear in terms of ensuring that AFB was um, fully accounting for its costs and its overheads in setting the rates, uh, and, and quite rightly so, and, and they pulled us and held us to account for that. So AFB have been developing a model ensuring that their full costs uh, are recovered in their charging for work, and that will actually uh, impact on, on their charges. Graham, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I mean, obviously there, there are opportunities out there for AFB. It is a, an exceptional organisation uh, with, with very talented individuals there. So I would have thought that uh, their, their research was very marketable uh, and we would be encouraging them to, to take the opportunity. Yeah, OK. With regard to the re relocation of the headquarters, is this the right time, given the current climate that we have, to be moving forward with this? Or should that not be put in hold while we protect frontline services? Um, as I said earlier, um, 
this is a programme for government commitment. The executive has, has approved it. Um, the money is mainly capital, and the, uh, we set aside that in our uh, in our plans. Um, and the minister's been absolutely clear; it's a top priority. Anything else, Chair? I think too that you know, the executive took a decision on twenty sixth of June to to go ahead with relocation. Um, at that point. The um, Minister was very clear that she expected the Executive to fund relocation and that it would be additional to the DART budget, and that remains her position. She is looking for additional funding over and above anything that the Department would gain normally, if I can do it like that, uh, to fund relocation. It is an Executive commitment, not a departmental commitment. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I just make one further comment? Okay. I have raised the issue before, as Edwin has raised the, the quantum of capital and revenue or recurring costs of this computer system. And I would still be concerned that there's a lot of money being thrown at it, and I'm not so sure that we're getting value for money. And, you know, what size of a team in the house do you have in terms of you know, computer systems engineers? who must have some knowledge of the capability of the existing system and what's required in the new system. Uh, do I take it from what you said, Noel and Jerry, that we have, now have to go to outside tendering again? Uh, and that means that we have had a target amount of money at this, and therefore the tendering process is, going to, is likely to be 53 minimum, maybe plus. Um, how, how much real rigorous analysis has been done on the requirements and needs and the uh, cost expenditure that's been incurred? And, well, you, you, you asked a couple of questions there. So just, I'll bring Jerry in. But in terms of the department's own IT resource, um, is it, there are a number of calls on that resource. Um, I mean, NIFAS is, is one. There are quite a few calls on it in terms of the requirements on single farm payment, uh, requirements on implementing the new IT systems under cap reform. So actually, from a management perspective, that's actually a concern for me in terms of the IT resource that, that we have and how we balance those resources. Uh, in terms of the cost of this, I think I can say to you is at a business case, um, put it to DFP, we're going to procurement, we're going to, uh, to uh, negotiate a procurement, and that's designed to get best value for money. Um, so, I mean, I can give you those assurances. I'll, I'll bring Jerry in, and, you know, again, I'm quite happy to bring uh, the internal experts up to, to brief the committee. Jerry? Yeah, we've set up a team to take forward the, the procurement. Um, they are being guided by Central Procurement Division in DFP. Uh, they have set out um, what they want the system to do. They have a, a uh, very detailed specification of user requirements. They have um, criteria being developed for how they'll judge the tenders. They have received expressions of interest from uh, the, the various parties and groups you would expect to bid for this work. So it is a rigorous approach. It is an approach that should deliver value for money. We couldn't do this work in-house at the same time as we are redesigning our systems around single farm payment. We're designing new systems for the different rural development programme measures. There isn't the capacity to design um, they they are redesigned the the EFAS product in house. Okay, gentlemen, I mean, first my reservations. Mm -hmm. Just just on that, sir. It strikes me as quite remarkable that we can con create a system which contains the data of 1.8 million human beings with all of the information regarding their health sometimes files a foot deep, and that costs £9 million, and you want to spend £53 million on data on cattle movements 
what's maybe one or two or three movements in their lifetime just doesn't stack up. And I don't know how you got the business case approved, but if you think this one's going to go away and people are going to lie down and say, oh yeah, uh, they've got the business case through and everything's acceptable, it's not. It's not acceptable to be spent in public money in these straightened times mm -hmm. in this way. And I haven't seen it demonstrated in a very clear and unequivocal way that there is a significant advantage and the benefits going to be derived from this. And we do need to go and legally deal with the issues around procurement to extend the lifetime of the current system as opposed to charging headlong into spending £53 million of hard-earned public money uh, in such a glib fashion. I would say I'm... I'm can't... Uh, I suppose... I can't accept the point on, on glib. Uh, you know, from my point of view, I'm, I'm not in, in, the, in the position of... of um, incurring public expenditure in the, in the glib fashion, that, that would be my, my view. Again, as I've said to you, I've taken legal advice, <coughs> professional advice on it. Um, I have signed off a single tender action for £7 million, for £7 million pounds, um, on the extension of the current system, which is pretty unprecedented in, in my view. <coughs> I, again, um, I, I'm happy that the committee would get a detailed I'm not sure what briefings the committee has had on this before. Uh, um, detailed briefing uh, to seek to provide the committee with some assurance. I, I, I hear Mr. Pitch your very clear reservations. Well, uh, it's 53, 53 versus 9 on a system which contains, you know, a multiple, uh, a considerable multiple of, of, of more information. Could, could, without seeing the detail, wouldn't like to. to um Judge the issue of the nine. We've made it clear that the 53 million two components um, ongoing staff costs for administering the system uh, plus the capital cost. Capital cost includes an element of optimism bias, so the tender should come in well below that, but that remains to be seen. Uh, satisfied that we have a rigorous approach to the procurement, satisfied that the procurement is not only necessary but will yield substan substantial savings. Um, that, that's where we're sitting at the moment. And you make a substantial saving of 53 million but you still spend 35 million if, if all went to plan. 53 would not be my plan but yes that could happen. Um, we have Try to make sure that the system will move forward in a number of parts so that we will be able to judge each part and judge whether to move on to the next. So it won't be one simple procurement at the outset and it's all done and dusted. It will rely on each part working and then us moving on to the next. So there will be a number of opportunities for the committee to see whether or not the money is being invested wisely. Mm. Mm. We're not convinced. Okay. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, on, on the whole issue of going for growth, should there not be greater priority given to um, going for growth over rural development, given the state of the industry and the need for reaching the going for growth targets? Well, I guess, as I've said, um, we didn't have, an, didn't have an allocation for going for growth. And the only allocations we've been given is the 19.6. Uh, the 19.6 was to deal with our structural deficit. The Minister will be seeking uh, allocating a million for that, uh, two million pounds for the farm business improvement scheme. And as we said earlier, it will form a core part of our policies. The Minister has said publicly that she'll be seeking and uh, wishing the Finance Minister for more allocation for going for growth. Uh, so she's absolutely making it a priority, but we just haven't been given an allocation. Uh, that's our issue. The um, Minister has prioritised uh, commitments under ANC and rural development as well. But we just simply don't have sufficient allocation. Okay. okay. Um, 
In relation to the IT system, uh, I'm aware, and I think I think Apple's system is in the mid nineties, some forty years in, in existence. I think it would be good if the committee could get a more detailed. And I think Jerry mentioned possible savings of eighteen mm -hmm. million now. Yeah. Regard, I think if we get a more comprehensive uh, assessment and and and. Uh, Maybe allay, you know, some of the concerns that this committee has in, in regard to the overall cost. I think it would be good if, if there could be a presentation given, yep. you know, yep. details and, and uh, set the record straight on those issues. Um, in relation to the 300 job cuts, are you able to give an assurance that uh, with 300 less staff, you'll be able to deliver the uh, new basic single farm payment on time next year? Um, delivering the single farm payment will be an absolute priority for Foster. An absolute priority. Uh, she's made that clear to me. Uh, I mean, it, it's a. Uh, it, if you were to drive the department's budget down by 50%, it would be a core requirement for the department to do so. Oh, you're content to that. Uh, that's the first thing I, th I would think farmers on the ground would be asking. I uh, see the job. <laughs> uh, and and may maybe I should have a answered Mr. Buchanan's uh, comments in, in that way too, sir. Okay. Thank you very much again for. Yes, sir, sir, can I just make one last point? Just, okay. Um, and, and I should have made it uh, on the consultation. Um, this is an important consultation, and uh, we definitely need to hear the committee's views. But I would say you know, this is setting the basis for the budget for future years. So it, it, the one-year budget is a strange animal of itself, pardon the pun. Um, so it, just when the committee is looking at it, it, it when well, you're just looking at one year, 15, 16, it does set the basis for future years. So I think it's important that I made the committee aware of that. Okay. Just, just before you go, in relation to Caffrey, you didn't mention Caffrey. Did you cut mm -hmm. this with Caffrey? Um, as, the, as the minister has indicated, um, there's no impact on the colleges. Uh, obviously... Our staffing reductions will impact on coffee in the same way it will impact across the department. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, we'll have to suspend for a few minutes uh, to see if we get our car.